They called it a miracle on a Thursday. By Sunday, it had turned into a massacre. Every breakthrough begins with someone shouting that the impossible has finally been conquered and someone else believing them. This time, it was a drug that promised to end the cruelest problem medicine faced, the pain that refused to end. The first patient stopped suffering within hours. The newspapers hailed it as a triumph. But what they didn't mention, what the scientists themselves didn't yet understand, was that the body sometimes applauds the poison before it dies from it. The true story of The experimental cure that worked once and killed everyone after begins in post-war Germany. Factories still smelled of smoke and antibiotics. Chemists who had once built nerve gas were reinventing themselves as healers. The public trusted chemistry again. Anything in a capsule looked like forgiveness. In 1953, the pharmaceutical company Chemi Grunenthal developed a new sedative they named thalidomide. Gentle, non-addictive, completely safe even for expectant mothers. Sleeping pills in the 1950s were violent things filled with barbiturates. Thalidomide promised calm without death. The laboratory tests showed mice sleeping peacefully, waking unharmed. The compound even helped with morning sickness in pregnant women. It worked. That was enough. By 1957, doctors in 46 countries were prescribing it under names like Contergan and Distaval. Pharmaceutical reps handed out samples at conferences the way bakeries hand out cookies. Within months, tens of thousands of pregnancies were touched by it. Then the first babies arrived. They were alive, alert, and horribly malformed, limbs shortened or missing entirely, some with no ears, others born without eyes. In others, the heart chambers failed to form. Morphine couldn't quiet the sound that filled the maternity wards when mothers saw them. The cause wasn't connected to thalidomide at first. Deformity was God's mystery. But German pediatricians compiling hospital data began noticing that the mothers had taken the same new drug at the start of pregnancy. The correlation was perfect. The cure for sickness had created a generation condemned. The official estimate today is between 10,000 and 20,000 babies affected worldwide, roughly 40% of whom died soon after birth. Survivors lived in wheelchairs or on crutches, icons of chemical hubris. Thalidomide had worked exactly once, in laboratory animals whose metabolism didn't mirror ours and failed catastrophically in people. It wasn't withdrawn in West Germany until 1961, two full years after the first warnings appeared in medical journals. In the United States it nearly repeated, but an FDA reviewer named Francis Oldham Kelsey refused to approve the application, citing lack of data. Her hesitation probably saved thousands of American infants. She earned a presidential medal for sea saving an entire generation from tragedy. It remains the most powerful proof that skepticism can be more heroic than discovery. The story could have ended there. A cautionary tale shelved beside others. It didn't. Thalidomide resurfaced decades later, this time as a treatment for leprosy and certain cancers. Used under strict regulation, it actually worked, shrinking tumors and reducing inflammation. It was the same molecule, neither good nor evil, only precise in its cruelty, dosage and context deciding life or limb. That paradox, the drug that redeems itself after destroying its first believers, is medicine's poetry and its curse. For a while, the scientific community took the lesson seriously. Regulations tightened, human testing ethics were defined, institutional review boards were born. But history has a recurring heartbeat. Excitement, speed, disaster, silence, repetition. Another miracle cure would appear soon after, this time armed not with chemistry but with DNA. In 1999, at the University of Pennsylvania, researchers launched an experimental genia, gene therapy nicia. Trial designed to repair a rare metabolic disorder called ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, or OTC deficiency. In animals, it looked perfect. Replace one missing gene, restore the enzyme, save the patient. The first human subject was Jesse Gelsinger. An 18-year-old from Arizona whose condition was mild and controlled with medication, but who volunteered so that newborns like him might one day live without hospitals. On September 13, 1999, he received the viral vector carrying the corrected gene through an IV drip. Within 24 hours, his immune system reacted like it had seen invasion. Fever rose to 109 degrees Fahrenheit. His organs failed in sequence, liver, kidneys, lungs. Four days after infusion, he was declared brain dead. Gene therapy, the future of medicine, had killed its first human participant in the very trial meant to prove its safety. 
Later investigations found conflict of interest payments, overlooked animal death data, and a culture of optimism that treated risk like an obstacle to be marketed away. One cure, one death, and a decade-long freeze on human gene experiments followed. The headlines called it a tragic setback. The truth was quieter, the same arrogance in a new language. That cycle has repeated more often than the public imagines, each time dressed in different scientific robes. In the 1920s, radium was sold as health. In the 1890s, arsenic cured everything from syphilis to sleeplessness. Each generation rediscovers the glimmer of salvation and assumes it learned caution better than the last. The experimental cure that worked once is not a single story but a loop spinning across centuries. The most haunting example doesn't T-center on chemistry at all but on human beings used as chemistry ES vessels. In 1932, the U.S. Public Health Service started a study in Tuskegee, Alabama, tracking the progression of untreated syphilis in 600 black men, without telling them they had the disease. For 40 years, federal doctors watched symptoms worsen while effective treatment, penicillin, was withheld. They had found their control group, people who would never suspect they were dying for data. When the press finally exposed the experiment in 1972, 128 men were dead, 40 wives infected, 19 children born with congenital syphilis. The cure existed for decades. It was simply denied. It took global outrage to create the Belmont Report, the document that defined ethical human research. Every consent form signed in hospitals today carries the ghost of Tuskegee. The same impulse connects every story. Faith that discovery justifies the damage. Thalidomide's smooth marketing, Tuskegee's bureaucratic language, the gene therapy team, S. Certainty that saving the future excused sacrificing the present. All different uniforms of the same sin. The modern era likes to think its safeguards made such tragedies impossible. Yet the headlines keep whispering otherwise. 2016. Gene editing trial in China modifies embryos that never meet consent criteria. 2018. Scientist He Jiankui announces the birth of CRISPR edited babies. Global condemnation follows, but the children exist, alive or not talking. 2020. A viral pandemic sparks races for vaccines and antivirals. Billions poured into experiments tested at unprecedented speed. Most succeed, some harm. All prove that desperation outpaces patience. Science never stands still. Neither does its shadow. What makes these episodes terrifying is not malice but motive. Each researcher genuinely believed in saving lives. Each result began with triumph. The first mouse slept, the first tumor shrank, the first gene replaced. Success flashes like lightning just before thunder collapses the sky. Hope itself becomes the accelerant. At conferences, survivors of medical disasters sometimes speak. Thalidomide victims still attend in wheelchairs, their arms shaped like fins, their words patient but sharp. We are the cost you forget to list. Bioethicists nod while PowerPoint slides click by, each bullet promising new oversight committees, stricter consent processes, better databases. Then coffee breaks resume, funding continues, and the world moves on, confident that the next experiment will learn humility from the last. It never does. Every technology arrives with a graveyard attached to its prototype. Airplanes crashed before flight became safe. Submarines imploded before oceans opened. And medicine, our most intimate machinery, perfects itself through the people it fails. To accept any pill or injection is to stand at the end of that lineage of risk. The cost of progress is written in human experiments that our headlines forget within weeks. The phrase, worked once, killed everyone after, is more than metaphor. In laboratories it describes an event scientists secretly dread, the result that confirms their theory only minutes before proving it fatal. In 1957 it was recorded in a thalidomide notebook as Excellent sedation, no toxicity observed in rodents. In 1999, on a ventilator readout in Philadelphia, the same pattern appeared as a spike in body temperature that confirmed gene expression right before organ collapse. Success and catastrophe are often consecutive frames of the same film. Medical textbooks teach that there are no miracles, only mechanisms. Every cure that seems impossible hides a variable too small to notice until it multiplies. The dose that heals one person kills another. The gene that corrects a protein also awakens an immune storm. The antibiotic that ends infection breeds resistance in silence. The danger is not science itself but our appetite for instantaneous salvation. We no longer wait for gradual proof. We want deliverance before breakfast. And somewhere tonight, as hospitals hum and laboratories glow through the small hours, another experimental treatment is being injected into a volunteer who hopes to be cured or to make cure possible for someone else. 
A researcher checks vitals and clicks a record, convinced this time will be different. Regulators have improved, ethics rules are stricter, statistical models sharper. Yet the pattern still waits beneath the surface. Breathing. We have not outgrown the urge to gamble with human bodies in the name of progress. Right now, across the planet, someone is swallowing an unapproved supplement sold as revolutionary. Someone is wiring a virus with a human gene. Someone is signing a consent form they barely understand. The experiments never stopped. They only changed their marketing. The disaster doesn't really start with villains. It starts with visionaries certain that the last tragedy was the last. The cycle is awake again, illuminated by lab lamps and laptop screens, whispering the same seduction. Just one more test. This time it will work. And today, as you read this, someone, somewhere, is about to place their faith in another experimental cure. Maybe it's a child in a cancer trial clenching a parent's hand. Maybe it's a man in a remote clinic taking a tablet bought online. Maybe it's a researcher injecting a mouse, praying that this time the numbers hold. The failures are not history. They're unfolding right now in real time. An unending human experiment repeated hospital by hospital. The safeguards exist. The knowledge exists. What's missing is restraint. If this story disturbs you, let it. Share it. Talk about it. Remember it. Because the victims of the next miracle will never know they were part of an old pattern repeating under a new name. Every click, every conversation, every warned voice can slow the wheel that keeps turning. The most horrifying thing about experimental medicine is not that it goes wrong. It is that we know exactly how it happens and we still keep doing it.